Good morning. Um, so I think I know everyone here, but I'm Maggie. I'm one of the PGY4s in the Emerge program. And today we're going to talk about emerging drugs of abuse. Woo! Tamara likes emerging drugs of abuse. <laughs> so our basic objectives for today are, one, to become sort of familiar with the history and the chemistry and the presentations of something that we're going to call new drugs of abuse. Um, to understand the social context from which these drugs arise and what they are sustained in, and to discuss an approach to managing uh, people that come in intoxicated with new type drug ingestions. So just to give a little bit of uh, historical context to all of this. So basically since the beginning of civilization, so for the last 8,000 years since we can think of, people have found different types of ways um, to become intoxicated or to alter their mental status. So it's not something that's at all new to us as a species. When we think about this in like a historical context, so most of the time um, in the past, it's been used in the context of religious ceremonies or a spiritual guidance, and it still is in a lot of places around the world. So psychedelic drugs are used in religious ceremonies and social situations, um, and it's something that's quite common. The other time that we see it um, is in a social context. So there's lots of places around the world where people do things, do things like chew petal berries or take different substances to help themselves socialize. Um, and even in North America, there's different substances that are becoming more socially accepted. So whether it's, you know, sitting in a park and um, in San Francisco and smoking a joint, um, going to a party, or having a few beers with your residents or your program director. So. <laughs> so there's lots of um, medicinal purposes that have been looked at for psychoactive drugs as well. So marijuana being the classic example. So nabilone or sesamet is something we use quite frequently now. There's also different psychedelics that have been looked at. So people have been studying cytobillin mushrooms for um, PTSD and for anxiety. And of course, LSD in the 1970s was classically used in uh, new age psychotherapy. That's not usually what we think about when we think about drugs of abuse in the emergency department. This is more like what we think about. So we think about all the negative effects that come out. So car accidents, um, dependence, violence, destruction of relationships, all the medical problems that come with using too much of something. Either way that you think about it, probably what we see um, on either spectrum is just the top of the iceberg of what people are using and of what people are doing. Um, we don't have a full picture of exactly what's going on. So just to keep things um, in context again, so if we actually look at drug use in Canada over the last two years, we're seeing a decline in all categories. So if you look at the last two years, even when it comes to things like alcohol, it seems that people are using less and less of, um, of these things in Canada. And then if you look at American numbers, so this graph comes from something called um, monitoring the future. So this is a national survey that's distributed to high school students all across the United States. And they ask them various questions about what drugs they're using and what their perceptions of those drugs are. So if we look at this again, we see that overall there's a decline in all trends. So there's less and less alcohol use. So we're at a historic low for binge drinking among teens. Um, not many people are smoking anymore. And then illicit drugs. So they're kind of staying the same, but are declining in almost all respects. The caveat is that there's one category of, of drug abuse that's going up, and that's prescription drug abuse. So I just wanted to take a moment and talk about prescription drug abuse because I think it's irresponsible not to mention it when we're talking about substance use issues because I think it's the biggest problem actually that we face right now in terms of substance abuse issues. So like I was saying, so this is from that same monitoring the future survey. So if we look at sort of any illicit drug other than marijuana use in a lifetime, and this is again a survey of, of um, grade, I think it's 8, 10, and 12th graders. So overall things seem to be going down. But if you look at opiates um, and, um, and other narcotics, it's gone up significantly in the last few years. So more and more young people are using opiates and prescription drugs and stimulants would be the other category that's going up like this. So if you see this, the next question that you need to ask is, where are they getting it? So same survey. So what they looked at was that 
most of the time, it's not on the internet or really from like a dealer that people purchase this. It's usually given to them by a relative or a friend, or it's bought from a relative or a friend, um, or some of them get, have prescriptions that they carry from their own GPs or family doctors. So getting more from their family members. And if you look at how we're actually prescribing opiates and stimulants, so even though everyone acknowledges that there's a big problem, um, every year these numbers go up. So we're giving more and more prescriptions for different narcotics and more and more prescriptions for different stimulants like Adderall and ADHD medication, despite the fact that we know that there's a huge substance abuse issue on the rise. We know that this is also affecting our emergency departments. So if you look at the numbers from 2004 to 2008, so the amount of visits that involve non-medical um, use of a narcotic have nearly doubled in all categories all the way across. So this is having a big impact on our system. I think that it's important to note the role that we play in this and just to be very mindful of our, um, I guess, role in the substance abuse big picture of things. But today, um, we're not going to really focus on that. We're going to talk about something else. So what I wanted to talk about today is what I like to call new drugs of abuse, and this is not something I made up. This is uh, something taken directly from Mark Mitzik. So he calls them non-traditional, emerging, and web-based. Why is this so important? So there's a couple of reasons why it's important for us to know about these drugs and know how to manage them. So the first one is that drugs of abuse are constantly evolving. So like I said, from the beginning of civilization, we found different ways to use psychoactive substances, and that hasn't changed. But the way in which we use them and the way in which we make them is changing. And as science and technology speeds up, so is the rate at which these things are going to be being produced. Through the internet as well, there's so much more communication for good things and bad things. So there's different ways to spread information about chemicals, different ways of publishing information, different ways of moving product and data. So this really brings the point home that we're going to be seeing new things come in all the time. And you can't treat what you don't recognize. So um, I love the sepsis protocol, but we always have to stay open-minded. So a patient that's febrile and that's confused may be septic, but they may have something else that's going on. So it's really important to know all the different syndromes and toxidromes that come out um, so that we know what it is exactly that we're targeting. And then lastly, and also very importantly, is that we have to remember that we're a lifeline for most of these patients. So especially when it comes to our IV drug users or people that might have been already um, taken a step back from regular society, we may be the only contact they have to a medical person. This may be the one time that they come for help. We can be a source of accurate medical information. And on top of treating their medical problems, we have a chance to really address some of the underlying issues that always accompany any kind of substance abuse. All right, so beginning. So this is our first case, um, and this is a patient that uh, we saw, I think it was early in December, and what sparked my interest in this topic. So you have a 34-year-old female who presents to the emergency department in status epilepticus. So she's known for polysubstance IVDU. She uses all kinds of different things, um, but she's trying to be better. So she's involved in several harm reduction methods. So she uses clean needles, goes to needle exchange. She's also in a program where she's trying to actually get off of um, cocaine and heroin and some of these other things that she's doing. So she has a prescription from that clinic for methadone, Welbutrin, and Ciprolex. She's been running low on her supplies lately, um, but her boyfriend tells you that tonight what she did is what she crushed and she injected some speed pills into her arm. After she did that, he says that about half an hour she afterwards she like started feeling not quite right and she started having these back spasms where she would arch her back repeatedly and still had a normal level of consciousness but was really looking uncomfortable. And then a couple hours after that, she started having these generalized tonic-clonic seizures that would last maybe a couple minutes at a time and then would self-resolve. She never really came back to herself in between, so he decided to bring her um, in by ambulance to the emergency department. When you examine her, she's afebrile. Her vitals are normal. Um, her pupils are equal and reactive, and they're four millimeters. And then she's got these multiple really nasty-looking track marks everywhere. So it looks like there's maybe some old ones that uh, were infected and some new ones that look like they're not quite clean as well. You do some blood work on her, so everything's pretty unremarkable. Her ECG, she's got a bit of QT prolongation, and then uh, she has a urine tox that's drawn and it's positive for cocaine and for amphetamine. 
So any ideas as to what this could be? Uh, so I don't know very many cases of people injecting Adderall, but I, I suppose that's it's possible. Um, it could just be cocaine too, right? Like seizures and someone who is known an IV drug user has a positive cocaine, so that's possible as well. But in her, actually, what it ended up being is bupropion abuse. So she was injecting her Wellbutrin. So bupropion. So Wellbutrin is an NDRI, so it uh, basically acts at inhibiting reabsorption of your uh, norepinephrine and dopamine to try and give you a kind of stimulant effect plus act as an antidepressant. It's actually very, very similar structurally to something called a substituted cathinone, which we're going to talk about later. Um, but it's unique in the class of n new generation antidepressants. And it's used mainly to treat depression and also some addiction issues. So we all know Wellbutrin is used for nicotine addiction. And then on top of that, it's been used as an ad adjunct for things like people that are trying to quit cocaine. Um, and it's been described as unabusable by the FDA. So for these reasons, for years, we've been prescribing it to these high-risk populations, thinking that there's no harm that can come out of it. That is no longer considered to be true. So. It can be either snorted, so insufflated or injected, and it gives you a cocaine-like high. And the first reports of this actually started coming out in about 2002 where they started seeing prisoners. So some of the prison populations in the States were snorting their Wellbutrin in order to get high, and they were having these abnormal high rates of seizures. Um, and then since then, it seems like it's sort of made its way into mainstream culture in a lot of ways. The first reports of IV abuse in Ontario came in just around 2012 when people started presenting to the emergency department with seizures secondary to this um, or came in with in withdrawal and admitting to the fact that they had been injecting their Wellbutrin. So the way that it presents, so initially what you will get is you'll get the sympathomimetic toxidrome um, and seizures will be your most common your most common adverse event. And that's not at all surprising because we know that Wellbutrin can lower your seizure threshold like in an overdose case. So that's the thing that you'll see very, very commonly. The other thing that you'll end up seeing is a lot of localized tissue damage. So in the way that Wellbutrin is injected, what um, these people do is that they wash off the coating of the pill and then they put the pill in a spoon and then they heat it up and have it break up into its um, constituents. And then they, while it's liquid, very quickly we'll try and put cotton balls in it to suck up all the fillers of the pills and then suck out the Wellbutrin, the good stuff. But that's an imperfect method and you have to be very quick. So they end up actually injecting a lot of these fillers and compounds um, that are toxic to your local tissues. So they get these terrible side effects where they get abscesses and local tissue destructions from injecting it. And she actually had these marks on her arm. This isn't her arm, but um, she had marks on her arm and marks on her groin from where she'd had previous abscesses um, and cases of sepsis. This has actually become enough of a problem where in 2000, I think it was 2012, there was a chief coroner's alert that was issued on Wellbutrin abuse because in that year they found six cases where they thought the death of their patients was contributed directly to um, either snorting or injecting Wellbutrin. So the bottom line. So it, this is a no longer a drug that you can consider unabusable. Um, and for this reason, you have to be really careful when you're re refilling patients' prescriptions. I know that's not something that we do very often, but you can certainly imagine a situation where you have someone come in asking you to refill their oxycodone and their Wellbutrin and their Ciprolex. And obviously, you're not going to refill their oxycodone. But maybe you want to be nice, bargain with them, and then refill their Wellbutrin. But just be mindful of the fact that this could be something else that they're also abusing. And then the two serious adverse events that we think about, so seizures and tissue destruction associated with local infection is what you want to keep in mind. All right. All right, so moving on. So our second case. So you have a 22-year-old female that's brought in from the club um, after she has a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, and she admits to ingesting something called molly. Um, so while she's in the emergency department, she has a recurrence of her seizures and she requires you to intubate her. Um, and you start to work her up for a toxidrome and you find that her sodium is 120. 
and you correct it very quickly, very appropriately. Her seizures seem to resolve with her resolution of her hyponatremia, but then she goes on to develop rhabdomyolysis and DIC. So what's Molly? That's right. Okay, good. So MDMA abuse. So not something that's entirely new, but I think it's definitely worth mentioning. So MDMA, so you can think of it as sort of like a serotonergic amphetamine. It acts at your serotonin and your norepinephrine um, receptors, and it basically causes release of serotonin, dopamine, um, norepinephrine, and it also acts directly with vasopressin, which is one of the mechanisms in which people can get hyponatremic with it. It's not by any means a new drug of abuse. So um, it was first developed in the 1930s as an appetite suppressant. Um, they soon realized that it was addictive and made people feel really, really good. And then it was attempted to be used in psychotherapy in the 1970s and again sort of came to the same conclusions that maybe it's not a safe drug to use. Um, but it's still actually being investigated for lots of uses today. So um, one of the most novel things that I read about was that it's being considered in patients for anxiety associated with end-of-life cancer care. So still something that's being looked at um, in the right context for treatment of things like anxiety, PTSD, depression, by the medical world. In terms of its actual abuse history, so um, it first started to make an appearance on the club scene in the 1985 or around the 1980s, 1990s, and it was really, really popular. I don't know if you guys remember like candy ravers when you went to high school, I do. Um, so. <laughs> So this is around that time. So it's a really popular, great drug. Um, but then it started to lose popularity when people were no longer able to get the desired effects with it. So it's supposed to make you feel really euphoric and good. And then people noticed that it was actually just making them very anxious. Um, they weren't having the effects that they wanted from it. So it stopped being used and it got kind of a reputation as like a dirty drug. Um, but then somewhere around the last couple of years, it's made a comeback. So it's come back no longer as ecstasy but now it's something called Molly. And it's now sold most likely usually as like a, just a white powder and it's touted as being pure MDMA. So it's considered something to be almost natural and non harmful and it's become extremely popular actually. So Miley Cyrus would probably be like the most notable pop culture reference who's always singing about Molly and doing Molly. Um, but there's lots of other places where it comes up. So there's actually like even been a big New York Times article about how upper classes in the Upper East Side, you know, have these fancy dinner parties and all do Molly together. Um, and it's considered like a bonding ex experiment or experience. And uh, we see that reflected as well. So if we look at the use of, of MDMA um, across, again, this is high school students. So you can see there's a big speak sort of peak around the early 2000s and then it comes down and then it comes up and doesn't stay up so much. But the more interesting graph is the one on the right side when you look at the perceived risk. So people don't think that it's a risky drug. They don't think there's a lot of adverse effects that are associated with it. So it's considered to be kind of like a safe, fun thing to do. Um, there's two ways that people take it. So a lot of times it can still come as a pill um, or it can come as a powder and it can be snorted. So clinical effects. So this is what people want from it. So what, you, what you're aiming for is a sense of euphoria, empathy, a sense of connection with the people who you're around, um, feeling well and having moments of self-realization. It can give you lots of energy and wakefulness and increased arousal, and it can increase the stimulation or what you feel about the environment around you. So people feel like they have visual, audio, and tactile experiences that are more profound um, than when they're not on it. What you actually end up seeing a lot of times is when people take too much or they do the wrong thing, um, is they get anxiety, dysphoria, agitation, they get hallucinations, and uh, because it's serotonergic, they often wind up with something that's like a serotonin syndrome. They can also end up in a hyperhydronergic crisis or state. There's um, case reports of malignant cardiac dysrhythmias, hyponatremia like in our patient, and this comes from the direct acts of the drug, but also because people are very, very thirsty, so they actually get almost like a psychogenic polydipsia with it. They drink and drink and drink water till they bring their sodium down uh, to the point of where they seize or have neurologic effects. And then there's been case reports of hepatotoxicity as well. The most important adverse event that we're seeing here, so all the deaths that have occurred with Molly in Ontario recently have actually been secondary to hyperthermia. So they can get uh, their temperatures up into like 40, 41 degrees. They'll go into rhabdomyolysis, um, and then subsequently their body just shuts down. They get DIC, multi-system organ failure, and then they die. So 
the bottom line for MDMA. So it's making a comeback. So it's sort of mainstream again. So what we're, you can expect is people that are coming in with MDMA intoxicated patients. And then also, just because something is a powder and no longer a pill doesn't mean you know what you're taking. So um, people are coming in with what they think is MDMA, but really different substances or adulterated pills that they've taken um, that are trying to mimic the effects of MDMA. So if we go back to our case, so if we have the same patient, same exact picture, but this time instead of saying that she took Molly, she tells you that she took legal Molly, or she tells you something that she took white rush. Um, does that change anything for you? Is there anything else that you're thinking that she could have taken? So hard to say, right? Like it could really be anything, um, but things like legal molly or white rush. So specifically what this is refer referencing is uh, synthetic cathinones or bath salts. So bath salts, very, very bad rap recently, but they're actually something, again, that's been around for a really, really long time. So the parent compound cathinones actually come from a plant called cat, um, which is grown in large amounts in Yemen and in parts of Ethiopia, um, and is considered to be a part of their culture. So people take this plant cat and they chew it, and it gives them a stimulant-like effect. So it's something that can be taken, like, for example, before a long day's work, or if you're sitting around chatting with your buddies, um, and it's completely legal there. And it's actually, the law around it in Canada is a little bit iffy. So cathinone per se is illegal, but you can still bring it in. Like there was a case of a woman who was bringing in pounds of it, and then she was caught, but managed to um, not have any sort of legal repercussions from it because it was considered like a cultural food or something. So legal legality around cat is sort of neither here nor there. It's a big gray zone. So the actual structure of cathinone. So if you just look sort of on um, the right-hand side, you can see that they're very similar to amphetamines. So you just have that extra oxygen molecule on there. Um, there's lots of different types of ca synthetic cathinones that are made. So they all have different side chains and they all have different properties, but essentially still all act through either norepinephrine, dopamine, or serotonin. Um, and the different substitutions that are given to them give them different properties, variable amounts of activity, each receptor, variable amounts of CNS penetration. So here's just an example of all the different synthetic cathinones that exist. And you can see that some of them are scheduled substances, but there's still lots that are not. So there's some that are used or some that are not quite popular yet, so they haven't been made illegal. So people started first using um, synthetic cathinones in 1927. So that's the first time that one was made, um, made illegal almost immediately after it was synthesized. And then in the 2000s, sort of came back in as a legal high. And then interestingly enough, around the time when MDMA started being adulterated with different substances, over half of what was found in it was synthetic cathinone. So people were actually taking bath salts in the early 2000s, and they didn't know it. They just thought they were taking ecstasy. Um, but when it came back in the 2000s, it was the big advantage of it was that it was touted as a legal product. So it would be sold, sold either as bath salts or as fertilizer or as plant food um, and marked as not for human consumption to get around the laws. So head shops and gas stations all around, um, you know, would be selling and some of them still are selling these various products as legal highs for people. There's a ton of different uh, street names that you'll hear about it. So not important to sort of remember all of them, but just know that they can be called by different things. So like White Dove, Explosion, Cloud Nine sounds pretty good. That sounds like a good one. MCAT sounds horrible. MCAT sounds horrible. <laughs> That's the one where you get anxiety. Um, <laughs> So different ways to take it. So three main ways to taking it. So if someone tells you that they're bombing or they're parachuting, that means what they do is they actually wrap it in cigarette paper and then they swallow it. And then this sort of takes about 15 to 45 minutes to act and then has the longest duration of action, so two to four hours. And this is like when they take the powder and they wrap it around. And then keying is when you literally like take your key and put it in the baggie of powder and then like snort off your key. Um, and they'll do this two or three times, and then that'll last about two hours. Injection is not very common, so not a lot of IBDU from this. And then, again, just remember that these things are often hidden. So they'll be hidden in pills called Molly or something else. So you'll see them when you're not expecting them to. So although these are sort of the durations of action that are touted for these drugs, the Poison Control Centers report that there's effects that are seen for over 48 hours when people take some of these.
So bath salts have had like a terrible rap in the news. Um, this is probably the most famous case. So this is the, I think we, when I saw Aaron was there actually with Kate in Miami when this gentleman got brought in. So this is when um, the one gentleman attacked a homeless man on the side of the Miami freeway and then started uh, eating his face. Like it was very, very traumatic. But the interesting thing is that it was actually declared that he didn't have any bath salts on board, so there was nothing in his system. I still think it's really great that that was put in the news because it gave such a terrible um, reputation to these drugs that people really stopped wanting to use them. And there's been so many campaigns um, touting against the use of bath salts because of that case and several other ones where people come in agitated. And it's actually had, I think, an effect. So if you look at the patterns of abuse for things like bath salts, so it really started to have its peak in 2011, where there was over 6,000 calls to poison control centers in the States. And then that's sort of around when all these cases started coming out, you know, like the zombie um, drug abusers. So it's really lost its popularity. So in 2012, you know, it already went down to a third of what it was. And then in 2013, again, it seems like the volume decreased by third. So not something people really want to be taking. It's supposed to give you effects similar to MDMA. So someone would take one of these synthetic cathinones um, to get euphoria, empathy, and openness and increased energy. But we both know that that's not necessarily what happens. So what they end up getting is a sympathomimetic toxidrome. They actually get something called a mephedrone stink because they sweat so much, they get really bad BO. Um, they can get serotonin syndrome, especially with like metcathinone and some of the ones that have more serotonin activity. And just remember that a lot of times people are just taking a pill or a powder, so we don't know exactly what's in it. There's lots of co-ingestants that will cloud this picture. Um, and the composition of whatever it is that they're taking, really no one's sure what it is. If you actually look at what is causing people that take this to come into emergency departments, so this is a study that was done in the UK where they looked at their national database called Talkspace, um, and the main thing that seemed to really stand out, and this is not surprising again, um, which didn't show up here for some reason, was if you look, so agitation and aggression, so that's the main thing that... Uh, that they were getting calls about in their poison control center. And then looking just at another study quickly, so this is um, a systematic review meta-analysis of all the case series and all uh, the, just looking at all the calls um, that have been received for bath salts over the years. And cardiac was the number one reason that they found in this, but it doesn't say exactly what, so it could have just been calls for like sinus tack, but psychiatric is right up there again. So I have a video of someone who's taken bath salts just to give you an idea of to what they can look like. Which you can't hear. I'll just put my mic First time I've ever seen something like this out of this guy before. So it doesn't look like too much fun. I don't know. <laughs> Not something you necessarily want to be doing. But again, you know, people have good effects and they have bad effects from it. So causes of death reported to this. So most of them have been from excited delirium. There's been cases of myocarditis, malignant arrhythmias. Um, again, they can become hyponatremic. So there's actually been cases of cerebral edema and subsequent herniation and then serotonin syndrome. All right. So like we've been sort of alluding to, so there's all other, all other kinds of designer amphetamines that are coming out. So I think it's important to sort of look at what else is out there. So um, this case is very, very sad. So a 22-year-old guy who came in he, from a friend's house in cardiac arrest. Um, so they were all sitting around. Um, they all snorted something called Seventh Heaven. And he became really agitated and started hallucinating and talking to them about evil spirits. So they thought they would just give him some time to chill out. So... Um, they put him in another room and just, you know, turned the lights off and tried to get him to calm down. Um, but it didn't really work. So he sort of became more aggressive and violent. So they started getting worried about it, but still just kind of left him alone, didn't do anything about it, and then called another friend for help who came. And then because he was sober, he went in and started talking to this guy and at this point realized that he was a bit blue um, and pulseless. So they called the MS and then he came in and then had an unsuccessful code in the emergency department and died. So... This syndrome, like, what is this describing? So someone who becomes really agitated, more aggressive, really violent, um, and then dies. 
That's right, yeah. So it's an excited delirium, which is actually recognized as its own entity by ASAP just in 2009. So they get this agitated delirium, they get hyperactive and violent, they get hyperthermic, and then they have cardiovascular collapse. So seventh heaven, what this guy took um, is actually something in the 2C family. So this is a family of compounds known as phenylethylamines, which I can't say that word for the life of me. So um, it's the 2C family. So the 2CB would probably be like the hallmark substance. And Dr. Shulgin is considered the grandfark of, uh, grandfather of psychedelics. So he came up with a bunch of compounds um, that he experimented with. And 2C is sort of, the 2C family is to his credit. He, pun he published a book called PCAL, which stands for Funnel ethylamines that I have known and loved, a chemical love story. So him and his wife published this book. So even though 2C became illegal, don't worry, because in this book he published hundreds of different compounds from the same family with exact instructions on how to make them um, and with his suggested dosing. So the problem is that his methods were not entirely scientific. So what he would do is he would try and make these different compounds, and then for the most part, he would try them, or he would select his friends or other volunteers to try them, and then he would see what would happen. So in terms of his actual dosing regimens, they're not very, um, they're not very tested. So there's lots of variable effects that people will have. So um, based on how much you take. So if you take a low dose, 2C is supposed to give you like a stimulant amphetamine-like effect. If you take a bit more, you can start to have hallucinations, but it's still very pleasant. But if you overdose, which is very easily done, because a lot of the times you don't know exactly which one of these compounds you're taking, that's when things sort of go awry. Um, it becomes very unpleasant. They have hallucinations and seizures. They get agitated, uh, febrile, and tachycardic. Um, and if you look at all the sort of bad case reports of 2C, ingestions, it's all the fatalities that have happened have been through an excited delirium pathway. So paparazidine, so another type of drug, just so that you know that it's out there if you hear about it. So same idea, so it's kind of like a serotonergic um, stimulant, and there's two big ones, both of which are now illegal in Canada. So BZP at, uh, acts more like an amphetamine, and then TFMPP acts more like MDMA. A lot of times they're sold together and compound as one pill, um, and depending on how much you have of which one, um, you'll have the different effects. So methoxetamine, so this is legal ketamine. So you can purchase this online for free. Um, it's very structurally similar to ketamine, and it'll give you the same sort of high. So it's a dissociative agent, but it's apparently supposed to have less of an emergence reaction. Um, so not as much of the side effects that we see with ketamine. Um, but they would be the same. So it'd be like agitation, depersonalization, derealization. They can get hypertensive and tachycardic. And the way that you can tell that someone takes this is that they get that same sort of rotatory nystagmus that they will with ketamine. So bottom line of all our designer drugs. So it's really a heterogeneous group of compounds, and a lot of them still maintain legal status. They haven't been scheduled yet, or there's a gray zone as to whether they're legal or they're not legal. Um, a lot of them are ingested unknowingly by people and uh, know that really what you're gonna be looking for is aggression and excited delirium, and you have to treat this aggressively, because if you don't intervene, then you can have someone die on you. All right. So case number four. So this is a little bit different. So in this case, you have a 47-year-old lawyer um, who comes in and he's complaining of cough, chills, and feeling weak for several days. Um, he's like a very functional, very healthy guy. He's got no past medical history, doesn't take any medications at home at all, doesn't travel, and he was previously like fairly well, like has been a bit more tired recently, but doesn't really complain of anything. So you um, examine him, and he's a bit tachycardic, and he's febrile, and when you listen, he's got crackles in his left lower lobe, and when you do a chest x-ray, he's got a big pneumonia. So you start the sepsis protocol, you start treating him for a community-acquired pneumonia, and then as his lab work comes back, you notice that he's actually profoundly neutropenic. He's got an ANC of less than 100, um, and other than that, everything else seems normal, so you're a bit puzzled by what's going on. So can anyone think of something that would cause this? Yeah, so levamisole. So levamisole contaminated cocaine. So levamisole in itself um, is 
again, something that we created. So it's an immunomodulator that was uh, withdrawn in 2000 because of all the different bad effects that people were having from it. So mainly it was a chemotherapeutic agent or used for conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and now it's just legal. it's been uh, taken off the market for human use and it's still used as a deworming agent for animals. So that's how people can buy it and how people can get it. So it's used in two ways. So one is that it actually, they think that it can potentiate the effects of cocaine and it can make your high a lot longer. But the other one is that it's physically identical to cocaine. So it's used as a cutting and bulking agent because it makes, um, it's indistinguishable. Um, and I think even maybe it's just a little bit heavier so people can get more bang for their buck when they're selling cocaine with levamisole. And in 2011, it was actually found to be contained in um, 60% of seized cocaine by the FDA. So it's very, very um, common. So things that can happen. So a granulocytosis. So in someone who comes in and they have neutropenia that you don't have a cause for, this should be on your differential. So you want to make sure that you ask about drugs of abuse, especially in high-functioning people who will not volunteer this to you and that you won't be able to tell. Um, the other thing that I'm, it's famous for is causing a vasculitis or a pseudovasculitis. There's also reports of pulmonary hemorrhage and renal failure. So this is actually the whole spectrum of things that levamazole can cause. So most people will complain, excuse me, of uh, generalized malaise, fatigue, they'll have arthralgias, um, and then they'll have these really uh, scary looking skin findings, which I'll show you in a second. And then they have a very specific biochemistry that's associated with a levamisole vasculitis that we won't get into, but there's certain room markers that you'll send off and we'll come back positive for them. And if you're questioning whether this is the case, this is maybe a time we're doing like a urine tox and someone who you suspect is lying may be useful. So the leukoclastic vasculitis that they get, so what they get is these hemorrhagic um, boule and perfora, and most commonly you'll see them on the helixes of the ears and on the face, so like the nose and the cheeks, but they can really appear anywhere. What you can do if you suspect that this is your diagnosis is you can order, um, though you won't get this back, I'm sure, an anti-human elastase antibody. I'm sure that's something we have to send away for at the TOH. Um, or you can do like mass spec of the urine looking for levamisole specifically, um, which is not widely available, so that's not a practical thing um, to do, but it's good to know that it is an option if this is something that you're maybe highly suspecting or if it's like a criminal case. So the treatment. So for this, it's really supportive. What you really need them to do is stop using cocaine. So most of the things will resolve completely with abstinence of cocaine, but if they start using again, you'll see the vasculitis and the granulocytosis again. All right. Okay, so moving on. So our next case. Any questions about that? Krista. So our next case. So 19-year-old guy who's come in with his friends again um, because of some bizarre behavior. So he's been having some paranoid and suspicious thoughts. He's been having some auditory and visual hallucinations. And then when you talk to him, like even though he's talking to you about these horrible things and stuff that's happening, his affect is actually really blunt and inappropriate. He's otherwise completely healthy. Like he's 19, he has no psychiatric history. Um, he has no family history of any sort of psychiatric disorders. He doesn't take any medications. Um, but when you sort of talk to his friends, um, sort of more directly, what they tell you is this actually started a couple days ago when they were all sitting around and they spoke, smoked something called Spice Gold um, and they all took it and they all had it and he's really the only one that's been affected by it but he's been not himself ever since that happened. So you work him up, there's really nothing on his labs, um, his urine is completely clean, doesn't look like there's anything else that's going on, he's not febrile, not worried about a meningitis or anything like that. So what happens is he actually gets diagnosed with the first presentation of psychosis and he gets admitted to the psych floor. Within eight days, all of his symptoms completely resolved, and then he's discharged home. So what's this? Smoke something, it's herby, it's called spice gold. It's not, so salvia, I didn't talk about it. So salvia is, um, we don't see people with salvia a lot. So salvia is something that's smoked, that's legal. Um, again, it's used kind of like a pot substitute, but um, we don't see them because its effects are so short-lasting. So it doesn't usually last more than 20 minutes, so it would be rare to have someone come in with it because they're better by the time that they would get to the emergency department. Um, but this is along the same line. So synthetic cannabinoids, so synthetic pot. 
So um, again, like a whole family of compounds that can be used for this. So they're called the JWH um, family of compounds, and they're very similar to THC. So where they came from is actually the original research that they came out of was um, done under the umbrella of NIDA, the National Institute for Drug Abuse. So some the part of the branch of the government that is supposed to prevent drug abuse. And the idea was to look at uh, the benefits of THC and to make compounds that could be used just for medicinal purposes, so to make things like nabilone. Um, and Dr. Huffman, who all these compounds are named after, is actually incredibly upset that these drugs are being used um, recreationally. And I think there's a quote by him that says, like, only an idiot would take this stuff, like, for fun. So unfortunately, he made all these compounds, had really good intentions, but they've, how they, like their structure has been published around the world, so people have started making them. So they're considered to be sort of like a legal alternative to cannabis. They can be either sprayed onto different herbs and smoked, or they can be sold individually as powders and snorted. And this is an example of spice gold, so it comes out like this. Again, they come in all kinds of different names, all kinds of different packages. They're still legal in Canada. Um, so the two most popular ones that you can remember is uh, K2, like the mountain to climb, and of course spice. So if you think spice and then you think like Spice Girls album, so there's like Spice Gold, Spice Platinum, all the Spice Girls. <laughs> More spice. So uh, the effects are very variable and related to how much someone takes, but it's essentially very, very similar to marijuana. So that's people are just trying to get high like they would with pot. And then sometimes what they get is they get sort of agitation, drowsiness, confusion. They can have hallucinations. Frank psychosis is probably the most worrisome thing. And there's some reports of seizure, though. It's very unclear whether... Um, and there's too many confounders to say that any, at any point have they caused seizures. So psychosis is probably the most worrisome thing. So this is a case series on 10 previously healthy guys, like the one in, that we started off in our case, that all ingested synthetic cannabinoids of some kind and then had the psychotic breakdown and it resolved after a time where they were no longer using it. Um, the problem is that in all these cases, they all had other drugs that they were abusing, including cannabis. Uh, so it's unclear whether... You can't say that, you know, they took this and this caused this because there's all these other confounders that came up. From a cardiovascular point of view, so tachycardia, hypertension, um, chest pain has been noticed. And then there's been a few reports of actually myocardial infarction. So uh, young people. So this guy um, was 17 years old, previously healthy, came in with chest pain after using um, something called, I think, Mr. Happy. And he was found to have... Uh, you know, an MI on his ECG and then actually had biochemical changes consistent with infarction. And during this period, there was three other cases of young people that came in with the same symptoms and all had a rise in their tropes um, and changes in their ECG. So maybe it was just that one batch of K2 or, yeah, that's what it was. This K2 was really, really bad. Um, but again, just be wary that if someone tells you that they smoked synthetic cannabinoids and they're coming in with chest pain, even though they're young, if it looks like they're having an MI, uh, like work them up the way that you would anybody else. And then there's also some cases of acute kidney injury, which I'm not entirely convinced, guys. So um, this is sort of a letter to the editor. One case with a 26-year-old guy um, who otherwise healthy, didn't take anything, didn't take any sort of herbal meds, and he came in not feeling well and said that he had been smoking marijuana for the past year. Um, and uh, they worked him up, and they found that he had, like, pretty profound renal failure. There was no other cause that was identified for it. He had a biopsy done that showed just glomerular sclerosis. And then when they sort of went back and they questioned him more, um, they actually found that he wasn't smoking marijuana. He was smoking, like, one of these synthetic cannabinoids. And once he stopped it, his renal failure resolved. But he had also used um, different things during the time. And again, it's very hard from this one case to say that that was the sole cause. So the bottom line for this, so, so especially in the states where there's such harsh penalties for marijuana, so it's seen as a legal and hence safer alternative to smoking cannabis. The predominant adverse effects that you would worry about would be things that are psychiatric. And again, just remember that the substances are very heterogeneous. So they're also smoking herbs that this is sprayed on. So it's unknown what exactly they're smoking and what the effects of, of it are and whether it's the herb that's it's being sprayed on or whether it's the powder that's on the herb that's causing things. So lots of confounders. So still unclear exactly is what it's causing. Certainly not as alarming as, alarming as some of the des designer amphetamines that are coming up. Okay, so just quickly to go through a couple of other things. So what else are people trying? 
It's a purple drink. So who knows what purple drink is? So purple drink. So purple drink is something that we're probably going to see like at Chio, if anywhere. So it's Sprite or Mountain Dew mixed with candy that's like Jolly Ranchers and then liquid codeine if it's available, and some kind of cough syrup. So in the States, what it is, it's promethazine that's in their cough syrup, um, and here it's dextromethorphan um, that can give you sort of like an ethanol-type picture. So they look drunk, and they're very ataxic, and they're slowed. Um, you can get hallucinations, actually, with uh, like, it's like Robitussin DM would be an example. Um, but the main thing that you worry about is respiratory depression. So Justin Bieber is apparently addicted to purple drink. Um, but really what you have to think about is the Flaming Mo, which is the original alcohol plus cough syrup concoction. Um, death morphine, so crocodile. So this is something that's been in the news and it's been very sensationalized because of these terrible graphic images that are coming out of Eastern Europe um, and Russia. So it's a cheap heroin substitute um, where that's made at home. So codeine is bought over the counter uh, in these countries and then they break it down, they bring it home and they make death morphine with it. There's been no proven cases in Canada, and I don't actually think that we're going to see this coming up a lot because there's a lot of socio-economic issues. So in Russia and in some of these eastern countries, IVDU populations are extremely marginalized. They don't come into the emergency department. Um, they're not considered to be in the same class of people as everybody else, and uh, they have no supports at all. So when their heroin supplies run short um, or when the police come in and do a big sweep, these addicts are really not left with a lot of options. Like, they can't come in and seek help. There's not really, like, a methadone program or anything that's set up for them or the equivalent of such. Um, so... I don't really think it's going to make an emergency here because it's just so awful. So the average life expectancy of someone who starts to abuse crocodile is about two years. And the most dramatic thing is this terrible, terrible local tissue effect that you'll see. So kratom. So something else that's sort of coming up. So it's a legal plant that's purchased on the internet and it's been used for centuries um, to treat opiate withdrawal. And it's actually very unique in the fact that when you take it at a low dose, it acts like a stimulant. And when you take it at a high dose, it acts like an opiate. Um, so this is something that people can sort of buy and it can be bought as a powder or as leaves or like a gum that you chew. All right. So what does this mean to all of us? So I think the most important thing to sort of keep in mind is that unless you're like this like brilliant chemist that makes this stuff in your own house and then you're using it, like these people have no idea what they're taking and chances are that you probably won't either. Um, so you, on that same note, I just wanted to sort of cover our urine tox screen and what we go through. So how useful is a urine tox screen? Not useful, like we say that all the time. So just to sort of go through, so um, what things are going to be positive? So is speed going to come up positive on a urine tox for anything? So just yell it out. Amphetamines, okay. Um, what about MDMA? Yeah, amphetamines. Pseudoephedrine. It's like cold medication. Amphetamines. <laughs> Um, Wellbutrin. Yeah, amphetamines as well. <laughs> Ketamine. Nah, nothing. Propranolol. Amphetamines. <laughs> so just lots of cross-reactivity, not very, very useful. What about mephedrone, so like a bath salt? So it will not come up at all. Um, metcathinone, another bath salt. So probably not maybe. We don't know because no one's really ever looked at it. Um, tramadol. Nope. Morphine. OV, as Krista says, yeah. <laughs> Hydromorphone. Does it come up? Yep. Yeah. Fentanyl? No. Methadone? It does not. So, um, cannabis, yes. And then spice? No. 
So like really not super useful, right? Um, so what we're left with is sort of having aggressive symptom-based supportive therapy. So that's what you're going to be doing. So really what you're doing is treating the toxidrome um, that you see. So you're going to do your tox workup that we won't go over, um, and then left with treating that. So just some pearls of going through these things. So remember that when, sorry, airway and breathing are your primary thing that you're concerned with, but just remember for RSI. So a lot of these patients will be stimulated, they'll be agitated, that risk of rhabdo, so hence hyperkalemia. So just be very, very cautious when you're using succinylcholine because um, you could, could cause a cardiac arrest in somebody. Um, for their circulation, so hypotension is just treated with crystalloids, but I have an asterisk there because if your patient is hypotensive after taking any one of these things, you really should be widening your differential. It's outside of what you would expect with someone who takes any kind of amphetamine-like substance. So you have to be thinking, especially in people who are injecting things, are they bacteremic? Is there a sepsis picture that's happening at the same time as they're intoxicated? Really start to think outside of the box if you see this. For hypertension, um, your first line is going to be benzodiazepines. Second line, things like uh, alpha blockers, so phentolamine and nitrates. Beta blockers you shouldn't be using for the same reason that you don't use them in cocaine. Um, tachycardia you want to tolerate to a certain extent, but again, your first line will be benzodiazepines. And then always consider your universal antidote. So correcting things like hypoxia, hypoglycemia, um, giving naloxone if they have a decreased level of consciousness, and of course giving thiamine with your glucose if someone is cachectic or you suspect that they're um, not taking care of themselves very well. Uh, decontamination. So activated charcoal, no real true role. So only if you suspect that they've taken a large overdose of something and if they're presenting within the first hour would I consider giving it. Um, for multi-dose activated charcoal, decontamination, hemodialysis, there's really no role for that in any of these substances. So treating specific symptoms. So for psychomotor agitation, so you really, really have to be aggressively managing this. And benzodiazepines, again, so benzos are probably going to be your mainstay of treatment for any of these things. And remember to try and avoid physical restraints because um, they're going to just work themselves up. You're going to cause them to be more agitated, have a higher risk of rhabdo, a higher risk of self-injury. Put them in a quiet place, calm them down, don't provoke them, and give them benzos. Um, you want to avoid Haldol in these people. So this is not someone that you want to be giving like your tenon to in. It can prolong your QT, so it can uh, bring out an arrhythmia. There's some thought that it actually lowers your seizure threshold, so there's been no human studies about this, but there's been animal studies that it has shown to do that. It interferes with heat dissipation, and then for some of them, like they'll actually get like an NMS-type syndrome. So if you remember a Wellbutrin patient, she had that arching of her back. We actually think that was like an oxythonose reaction from the Wellbutrin. Um, so you can be exacerbating some of those things. Seizures, again, benzos, benzos, benzos. If they're not responding, consider sort of secondary causes of status. So check their lights, check their sugars. If they've been hypertensive and tachycardic for a long time, there's cases of people having intracranial hemorrhages. So expand your differential. Um, there's no real role for giving Dilantin to these patients because their seizure mechanism is through an entirely different mechanism of action. The only benefit of giving it was if they're hypernutrenic, you're going to be giving them a lot of salt. Um, Hyponatremia. So this is pretty much the same as for any other patient. So if they're asymptomatic, usually it's enough to just fluid restrict, uh, restrict them and they'll correct themselves um, over a short period of time. If they're symptomatic, just like with anyone else, so 100 cc boluses of um, hypertonic saline. And again, like you, you know, you always think that this is like a hyperacute state of hyponatremia. So probably one of the only times you're not worried about central fatty myelinosis, but just be careful. So um, you don't want to raise them by more than nine mil equivalents in 24 hours. So hyperthermia. So again, be very, very aggressive with temperature management. So external cooling with fans, um, with mist, with ice saline. If that's not working, then intubate them, sedate them, and if you need to, then I would paralyze them as well. In terms of treating serotonin syndrome, so you can go by Hunter criteria um, to determine whether or not they actually have serotonin syndrome. It would still apply here. And then, again, well, lo and behold, surprise, you give them benzos. Um, you manage their hypothermia, and you can consider giving ciproheptadine, but it's not necessarily going to be the life-saving thing. The main thing is going to be controlling their symptoms, so their agitation, their hypothermia, and the way that you're going to do that is with benzos. 
uh, if you're ever unsure about something or anytime you actually really have an interesting case that's coming in of someone who you're not sure what they've ingested, it's always a good idea to give the poison center control uh, a call. Um, and then we have an on-call toxicology pharmacist or pharmacy resident that's available to us at the TOH as well. So the benefit is that you get to speak with an expert, but also that there's a database that starts to be collected um, on these patients uh, when they're coming in. And remember that we are kind of like the canary in the coal mine. So once we start to see different kind of toxidromes effects, that's how these things get noticed. So when we remember like there are new drugs, so they're web-based. So there's websites that are like invaluable sources of information. So Arrowhead is a website that has every single drug of abuse, I think, that's ever been created known to man. And then it has like categories on their clinical effects, how to take it, what the legal status is in every country in the world. Like, it's a huge database of information. So that's something that you can use if you're not sure what someone is telling you. Um, Ecstasy Data is a really interesting website as well. So um, this is like a not-for-profit lab that's associated with Arrowhead where people can send in pills and powders that they've taken or that they bought, and they will actually analyze these pills and these powders and tell you what the composition is made of. So. Uh, that's useful if you're taking drugs. If you're not near the emergency physician, what you can do is you can go there um, and they'll have pictures and names of things and sometimes they'll tell you what they took. So maybe someone thinks that they took MDMA, but really what they took is 2CB. Doesn't really change your management so much, but it's a, it's a good source to know. And then there's some others on there as well. All right, so just to tie things up. So remember that psychoactive substances are sort of ingrained in our civilization. So they're here to stay. We're not going to make... Um, this not happen in society at any point in time, but new drugs of abuse are forever evolving, so we're constantly seeing different things and different effects come up. So you have to be aware of what's out there, um, and you have to be aware of how what it's called so that you can actually have a conversation with your patients about what they're, what they're taking. Um, you may not be able to identify the specific substance, so really what you're left with is identifying the toxidrome and then treating it accordingly. Aggressive symptom management is the cornerstone of your treatment, and that's really going to be mainly benzodiazepine. And uh, if you're unsure, remember that there's lots of help out there, so uh, you can always consult for expertise. That's it. <laughs> so any questions about any of that? Thank you.